connect, support, and inspire one another as they age. A virtual organization that offers a range of support services to assist members in need and a calendar of stimulating activities to engage members' minds. Our featured speaker today is Jeanne Roger, newly appointed executive director of the Benicia Historic Museum. Ms. Roger has an academic background in history, specifically early American history with a personal passion for historic architecture, particularly 19th century military architecture. So being able to come to Benicia to work in the Arsenal complex is a career highlight. Prior to Benicia, Ms. Roger spent the majority of her career working in museums and historic site fields. Most recently, she was the exhibits and collections manager at Hiller Aviation Museum in San Carlos. She is a great believer in the slogan from the National Trust, this place matters. Jen tells us that museums bring us experiences in meaning making, help us develop an understanding and connectivity to our shared history and wonder at the world around us. Without further ado, Ms. Jen Roger. Hello, thanks for having me, Vivia. Thanks for the introduction. Hi, Jen. Yes, I recognize your name off our mailing list. <laughs> so I have an idea of some of who some of you might be. Um, as, as Cynthia sort of gave you the introduction to who I am, I'll tell you a little bit about me. Uh, I started my job here uh, September 1 of last year as executive director. And I do come from Hiller Aviation Museum in San Carlos, where I was the, the exhibits and collections manager. So I dealt with artifacts every day, which this is a this is a transition in my world because now I'm dealing with more of an outside focus than you know artifacts don't talk back right. So now I'm actually I, I'm interacting more as a, a front of the house sort of employee than I was previously. Prior to that, uh, I come from the Historic House Museum community. So I worked heavily in Bay Area Historic House Museums and interpretation at historic sites doing public education. Ultimately, I go all the way back to a tenure at Angel Island. So I also do come from the state. So I have a little bit of that background in there as well. So this is an interesting step forward. It's a welcome step forward. And as she said, I do have a lot of fun coming to work in 19th century military buildings every day. We don't tend to appreciate them, I think, the way we should. And I have only recently found out that there are people that have no connectivity to us. So hopefully we can change that. We have something absolutely unprecedented, really, in California here. There's only two other Cal historic California military sites that really come close as far as architecture goes or what you can see with them. And I've got a couple of other examples to it, but primarily it's either Fort Tejon down at the Tejon Pass or uh, Drum Barracks, also down in Southern California. While there's some examples of fortifications and things that exist from the early 19th century in California and in Northern California, nobody has what we have. And I think that is sort of undervalued right now. I know one of the things Cynthia kind of made mention of in an email to me was, you know, where, how I see our appreciation of our historic sites. And I have to say, I think we're kind of missing it. I look around us and our history here at the museum, especially, and, and our site with buildings that date from 1854 to 1857, where else can we see this, right? There are sites all across the East Coast that would kill to have what we have, and they don't, right? Our closest options, as I say, are mostly in Southern California. Benicia Arsenal was founded, well, it's an outgrowth of the Benicia Barracks, but Charles Stone was sent here to actually found the Arsenal. And he comes out here with the purpose of recalling all of the arms and ammunition, basically on the West Coast. So he brings things down all the way from Washington and Oregon. He brings things from San Diego, from Monterey, all across California. The point was to essentially inventory the material. Well, 
once he gets out here and he builds the facility or oversees the construction of the facility and calls all of this home, you say, okay, well, what do we do with it? Well, that's where we have this unprecedented aspect of what we're doing and where we are. Benicia Arsenal is responsible for arming the Bay Area. And we forget that. And I think that's that ties us especially to the defenses of the San Francisco Bay, which we tend not to embrace. We have, if you're all familiar with Fort Point, which is right under the, the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, Lime Point is actually right across from it, or would be, and the federal government tried to build there as well. They never got the, the sale of the property, but they did want to have a fortification on the other side, what would be the Golden Gate Bridge too. Uh, today it's Fort Baker. They had a military installation in the 1860s at Camp Reynolds on Angel Island which is still there in a sort of state of arrested decay, but it is still there. They also had an installation on Alcatraz. For any of you who are familiar with the cell block, the main cell block at Alcatraz, actually the Civil War fortification is underneath it. And it does still remain underground under the cell house block, what's left of it. Well, all of the arms and equipment for those locations came out of the arsenal here. So, our storage buildings, if you're familiar with our site at all, we have building or what we call building seven and building nine. Uh, there, those numbers are actually turn of the century designations. They're not original military designations. Numbers assigned to buildings in the early 19th century were actually assigned by plan of structure, architectural design, not numeric sequence for like inventory. So works a little differently. But our buildings seven and nine were meant to store gun carriages, uh, artillery pieces, which we call field artillery. So it's things like three inch ordnance rifles, Napoleons, howitzers, things like that, mountain howitzers. So it's field artillery uh, meant to store carriages, caissons, limber chests. So it's heavy material, right? So our floors are weight rated in tons at this point, which is kind of an interesting construction. It's all built out of sandstone that's locally quarried, actually quarried right on our site. So we have a tie to our area in such a way that most places don't. It's kind of an interesting, I think, or rather I can sort of geek out over that. It's sort of an interesting perspective. We also have our powder magazine that was built in 1857, which was a hand carved structure or still is a hand carved structure. It was actually a contract between Charles Stone and the government and, uh, a man named William Merrill. So there's our, our stone carver. And it's all hand carved. All of these are. All these blocks are hand carved. And each one, if you really want to get into sort of the, the aspect of it, talks and speaks to the material culture of our world, right? Material culture is the anthropological study of stuff, if we really want to define it loosely. Right? It's the history of a tangible thing. So it's what is, what is my, I mean, my phone's on the desk, right? Here's my phone. What does my phone say about me? What does my phone say about the manufacturer of the phone, of the equipment of the, that, that is contracted to go in the phone? It's the story of everything. And I think you can tell that greater story in relatively simple, I kind of employing relatively simple diagnostic means maybe by looking at what we have. So that kind of gives you an idea of our structure and where we are. And if you haven't come out and visited us, I hope ardently that you do. I think we have a lot to offer and to kind of give you an idea right now, we, we're just getting to the point of opening our special exhibition, which will run for basically till the end of May. Uh, and that's on the Frontier Odyssey. It's, a, it's sketching the American West. And it's artists that were sent from Harper's to come out in the 1870s and basically go all the way from New York and ultimately out to Hawaii to sketch the American West. So people on the Eastern seaboard could get some sort of understanding of what we are like or what the plains are like. Now, the interesting aspect to that, if you're familiar at all with true Western history and possibly the, um, the academic paper, like the closing of the West, by it's the Turner thesis by Frederick Jackson Turner. 
uh, he actually writes in the 1870s and says, the West is closed, right? There is nothing more to explore. We're done, right? Our, our understanding of American manifest destiny is basically over. We have completed our action, right? We went as far to the seaboard as we could, and now we're done. Well, there's a nostalgia to that. And there was a nostalgia to that with Harper's also in sending people out across the country to go out and actually record this and bring it back. So I, I encourage you to come and check that out. I also encourage you if you're interested in local artists, come check out Art Camel. That's a kind of unique experience that's running uh, as an association between the museum and HQ Gallery down on First Street, where we're bringing in local artists and putting them and installing their work in Stone Hall, which is basically an underutilized cultural space at this point. And it's our rental space the rest of the time, but when it's not rented, now it's being filled with art. So that's available for viewing with regular museum admission, but I'd encourage you to come check that out also. We do have our lecture coming up on Saturday at 11.30 on women in the California gold rush, which if you're interested in women's history at all, is kind of intriguing. I look at the way we present history and actually that's sort of where we're going forward as far as my vision for the museum. It's time to step it up. Uh, if you've seen our advertisements for everything from first Fridays to our new exhibition schedules, we need to take a more active role in our community. And I feel like that's where this needs to ultimately go. So it means reworking some exhibit materials. It means changing the way, sort of the business model of the institution to focus more heavily on public education and public programming. That's how we grow a museum. So I'd like to see that happen. In fact, we do have some fairly big announcements as far as how we're growing our institution that you'll probably see in Venetia Magazine in about a week. So I would, I'm gonna encourage you to stay tuned for that and just tease you a little bit and say it's gonna be worth the read. Uh, as far as our topics, we are currently reworking the Gold Rush exhibit, which I know actually received a fairly good response from schools when it was put up about three years ago. It's time for an update to it though. Uh, galleries are never meant to stay the same and that's true for ours as well. So it's slowly time to, to start reworking what we consider the permanent exhibits in the gallery. And Gold Rush is the first to get the facelift. So I think by August, that should be totally completed. It'll actually include your ability to go inside a mining camp, which I think will be sort of a fun experience and hopefully an experience that we can bring in school kids with and there'll be a little bit greater of an attachment to. The studies of material culture or of how cultural constructs work in our society really does require a degree of tangible at this point. So we want to make an immersive experience that everybody can, can relate to. Or at least that's the goal. Galleries, this, this is probably going off on a tangent, but galleries are built or constructed in the museum world on what's called a meta narrative of evolutionary progress. Big word, don't bother memorizing it. But the way it works is everything should be in some chronological order, right? Whether it's good to bad, bad to good, date timeline. It, it is some evolutionary progress that as you walk through, the, through any museum gallery, you should have that experience that one concept builds on another. So that's kind of what we need to aim for as we, as we start to, to rework some of this. So I figure I'll give you a little taste of Women in the Gold Rush. It's not gonna be the same presentation that our speaker will give, but now that you have an understanding of who I am and sort of my vision for the museum, since it is Women's History Month, we may as well give a nod to that and look at Women in the Gold Rush. So I'm gonna tell you to go ahead and throw out everything that you have in your mind about the American West and about your preconceived notions about women in the 19th century and certainly then resultantly women in the gold rush. Women do very well in the 19th century, contrary to a lot of popular culture and a lot of popular programming, what have you. Really because most of that is colored by what Hollywood has done. It's colored by novels from the 1950s forward where the cowboy becomes the hero and 
things like gun smoke where we need to, you know, Miss Kitty has a business, but you need, you know, you need Marshall Dillon to go and save her, right? It, it's, it's very heavily colored by that. And that's not, it's not the reality of the 19th century. A lot of what we understand for women's roles in the 19th century also comes really from kind of first and well, not first wave, more like second wave feminism. I'm not sure what wave we're on now, but a lot of it comes from our need to promote a feminist ideology, which necessitates sort of a degradation of what comes before us, right? To say our ideas are better because they're better than the past. Well, that may or may not be a good reality in which to base an argument. If we look at women in the 19th century, and we obviously need to go back to somewhere around 1800, where we can see the, kind of the, the beginnings of some of women's public roles in the workforce and in a, in a true kind of money-making scenario, if you will, with the socioeconomic development, we need to look at the way society is structured and where women's work comes from. And I'm kind of going to air quote women's work because it's a little debatable too. Um, we had between about 1800 and about 1840, America is going through its industrial revolution, right? And we tend to think of the industrial revolution as the Gilded Age from the 1890s, but it really has its seeds about 1800 where initially women's employment was truly working on what's called the put out system or piecework. So as a manufacturer, I would say, build an article of clothing, uh, build a, a shoe, right? Whatever my, my product needs to be, but I'm not gonna do the finish work on it, right? I'm just gonna do the rough work and the finish work is gonna be sent out and done outside the manufacturing. So I hire women to do the finish work. Well, that's the put out system. Well, by the time we, we hit the industrialization process, early industrialization in our country, we're changing that role. And the put out system is starting to fade away. Things like apprenticeships are starting to fade away. As we move from an agrarian base, we change everything. We change our social structure. We change our political structure. We change our economic structure. And it begins with the change from the agrarian society to an industrial one. So women start looking for other means of employ. And yes, there has always been domestic work. There's always been that kind of servitude, if you will. But what are they doing? The big leap forward really comes in roughly the 1830s, late 1820s, early 1830s, with the rise of the textile mills, uh, boot mill, for instance, in Lowell. Lowell, Massachusetts, it's known for its textile production and early textile production, because they were able to harness the power of basically a, a river confluence and turn the wheels and turn the belting on the machinery and start textile production. Well, those early factory jobs become very attractive to young rural New England women who really have no other option, right? What are they gonna do, right? They're gonna be stuck in sort of this agrarian lifestyle or they can take a jump to something industrial, like so many people are doing, young men, women included, right? It doesn't matter. But these women make a bold move, and they actually become known as the Lowell Mill Girls. And they have their own dormitories at the Lowell Mills. They have their own newspapers. They're printing their own flyers. They're going to their own evening education classes. This is a huge step forward for these women. But then what happens? We hit the, the 1830s, close to the 1840s, with the rise of the textile unions. And they don't want women's membership. So that starts a process that separates these young women from industrial labor, right? From that kind of industrial labor, certainly at the low mill. And you really don't see a huge return to industrial labor until we get into the 1850s uh, again. So you lose it for about 15 to 20 years because these unions that are male dominated basically kick them out because they don't want women's membership, right? And it starts with, again, these Lowell Mill girls. Well, you've given them a taste of something better, right? And that gives, industrialism gives basically people who would have no other opportunities a taste of a better life. 
So as we move forward in our timeline that's going to ultimately get us to California, we start looking at, okay, what else does the 19th century do? What cultural constructs are we talking about changing? Well, we change childhood, right? We all have this preconceived notion that Victorian children were seen and not heard. That is not an American concept. That is not a 19th century concept. That is a nostalgic look back at the 19th century that pops into American culture somewhere around 1910. It is not the 19th century. We define childhood in the 19th century. We make childhood end at 18. We think that if kids like being home, they're gonna stay home, right? Because otherwise, what's the option? 3,000 miles away, going to California, never coming back. We don't have the transcontinental railway yet. So what are we gonna do? We make it fun. We invent parlor entertainments, ruckus parlor games. We have parlor bowling for kids. They're, they're tossing toys around our, our front rooms. These are, these are the real American concepts of the 19th century and how we function in society and where we start to grow. So, okay, what happens? Well, now we need further economic opportunity. So we're going to California, right? Gold is found January 24th, 1848. And we're gonna go out there and seek our fortune. Well, we're going to seek our fortune as men and women in different ways. And that's sort of where we need to begin to understand women's roles in the gold rush and kind of women's roles in California to begin with. Let's look at California. Uh, California is an interesting place because by the time we hit 1848, 1849, right, depending upon where we are in our spectrum, we've gone through a Spanish colonial period and we've gone through a Mexican colonial period. Once we hit 1848, actually after gold was discovered, we have the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and we become America. We become part of America. Now, admittedly, there's a discussion between the United States is and the United States are that doesn't get solved into the Civil War. So don't go down that road right now. That's its own topic. But we become Americans. California shows up as, a, as you know, under American rule. Well, in order to take over and to really make California be, we have to pay some homage to the Spanish and Mexican land grants that were already here. Now, admittedly, the land grants fail and with the gold rush and the influx of immigration and the, the land grant holders basically lose out in the end, right? They have to go to Monterey in person to try to fight for a land grant that most of these families have no paperwork on. So, they, they are sort of the big losers at the end of this, right? Are these old Rancho families, these old California families. But we can owe our experience as gold rush women to what those land grant holders are fighting for. People like Pico, who have nieces who have already signed contracts, right? Who have already become property owners. Six of these land grant families sit on the Constitutional Convention. And why? Well, because under Mexican rule and under Spanish rule, women own, women own the right to own property. Women have the right to sign contractual agreements. Women have the right for divorce. Women have the right to take and expect the, the custody of their children in divorce. California's law, right, even under Mexican and Spanish rule, comes from Spain, ultimately. Our Eastern Seaboard law, New England's law, comes from Britain. It's a huge difference in the 19th century. It's a huge difference. So you have people in a culture in California that is already accustomed to women that have protected rights, legal protected rights. So we have to pay a nod to that, right? Because even when you look at early American immigration, which predominantly comes from New England, they have to make some concessions. And what's in California at this point? Well, the gold rush brings out ultimately 200,000 people to California. That's the largest voluntary migration in Western history. All of these people are coming to California, but who are they? Well, initially in 1848 and early 1849, they're predominantly men between the ages of 18 and about 22. So, here they've thrown off the constraints of home, 
and the constraints of New England, because a lot of them, actually the majority of immigrants from the Eastern Seaboard are coming from New England, but they're throwing off the East Coast and the social spheres and the constructs that are already built into society and coming to California, which has always been a place that has embraced that entrepreneurial spirit. It's embraced uh, the ability to redefine yourself as a person. Come to California and redefine yourself. And that's true in the 19th century. Our attitudes as Californians are deep-seated. Our, our understanding of if we can build it and we can do it, we can make it happen, are very much rooted in that early 19th century experience. So we're not very far from these people. Remember, there's, there's still people who have grandparents and great-grandparents who fought in the Civil War. People who remember them, right, are still alive. So we're not far from this experience. So they come out to California, and now they're in a lawless society, or an essentially lawless society, as young men. Well, that can lead to any sort of criminal behavior, vice, what have you, right? But they come across the plains, and their experience coming across the plains or coming around the horn is going to influence their experience in California. And ultimately, they try to set up mining towns, and they will grow it to be a society also. But now what do we have to do? We have to attract women, right? Because as the population in California grows, if we believe in things like the cult of domesticity, we need to attract women. We need to attract a civilizing nature to the West. And how are we going to do that? Well, let's go take a step back and remember that constitutional convention and those six families who participated in it and argued for women's rights. Well, now they're constitutionally protected women's rights. So guess what? You come to California and you can do things as a woman that you can't do on the Eastern Seaboard, that you can't do in areas of your own country. So California's women's rights has been there basically since the 1830s, 1840s, when we start looking at how we define a culture and how we define a society. For the Spanish and Mexican land grant families, it had been there since 1776. So they grew up with this, right? This is a world that they operate in. So you get these women. And now we get an influx of women coming on the Overland Trail. It's not just young men that are 18 to 22, 24 anymore. Now you're getting family groups. You're getting groups of women. You're getting individual women also. Let's not forget that. They are doing this. And it's a different experience. Cross, and we're going to talk about crossing the Overland Trail because looking at going around the Horn or going through the Isthmus is an entirely different experience in its own right. So looking at coming across the Overland Trail, what do we do? Well, you start looking at women's primary accounts of coming across the Overland Trail and they're mundane. They're not full of adventure necessarily, although there are, there are some. They're mundane tasks of everyday existence, right? And you start reading through them and you realize everything is about crafting some sort of domestic sphere as best as they can do, right? In a consistently changing environment. And then all of a sudden you'll find an entry that says, I had a baby today. So it defines what people see as important, right? Where is that a life-changing experience? Well, we may think it is, right? As modern adults, we may think so, but they don't see it that way, right? It's another facet in a daily existence, which is in some ways not terribly different from our own, but in some ways we're a vast gulf difference from the social constructs of their sphere. As they come across the Overland Trail, what are they doing? And in, basically from the 1840s, 1844 or so, through about 1850, it's a vastly different experience coming across the Overland Trail than it is after 1850. The early days, there's no competition, right? So you get groups coming across. They're going to Oregon. They're going to California. Ultimately, they're going to the gold fields when they get to, to 48 and 49. And what happens? They run across the Lakota. And this is another great thing that I just, I, I love to sort of dismantle the modern narrative. Prior to 1850, you see really very few confrontations between settlers and native populaces. In fact, there are several comments, a lot of them, I mean, to the point where you actually start going, okay, this is not just a one-off. This is, this is the way they see this. 
they comment on the physical, be- the physically beautiful nature of the Lakota people. They comment on the fact they understand, they don't get it, right? They don't understand what's going on. They are formed by an Eastern culture, but they understand that there is a culture. They understand that there's a social hierarchy. And they interact with them, but they interact with them sort of at a distance. Nobody really cares about each other, right? It's kind of like, oh, yeah, there they are. They don't get it. Somebody will cut a cow from a herd. Okay, fine. Somebody else will do, you know, what have you. But they do trade. They do interact with them as far as individual people. It is not necessarily a group activity. And it's relatively peaceful. By the time you hit 1850, however, those things start to change. And you start to see massive competition because now we're talking about thousands of immigrants crossing the trail every day, right? So now there's competition. There's competition for resources. And that's where you see uh, an antagonism start to grow, right? Because now we're not just talking about one off, two off, you know, I'm, I'm using that generally speaking, but, you know, a couple hundred wagons, right? We're talking about thousands of people and they don't know how to work with each other and they haven't figured it out because it's not, it's happening so consistently. And it does start to, to turn antagonistic. But that's true in the California gold fields as well. That has, whether it has anything to do with the natives or not, it's, I now have to fight for gold, right? The 48 and 49 placer miners have it easy. They can pick up a batea that's consequently brought up from South America and find relatively easy pickings. They can stick a, a, a rocker box on the bank and come away with two, three ounces of gold. But now by 1850, I've got to work for it. Work for it to the point where I'm panning 80 pans a day to pull an ounce. Now an ounce is about $13 for them to kind of give you a, an idea of where that sits. And $13 doesn't go too far. It doesn't go as far as you think in the gold rush because inflation happens so rapidly to the point where there are examples of eggs going for $12 an egg. So got to remember, everything is sort of on, on par. Today, I think gold is running somewhere close to $2,000 an ounce. So kind of see where it's going. Actually, it remained fairly consistent until I want to say about the late, 18, late 1970s which is kind of intriguing. So they come out here and now they're working twice as hard. Well, the women are gonna fill a vacuum and this is kind of the interesting role that they start to play out here because they do have constitutionally protected rights. They're gonna fill a vacuum. They're gonna start by opening restaurants, opening laundry facilities. They run boarding houses and hotels. They run mercantile establishments. They're filling a role that their male counterparts aren't filling. So they become independently wealthy in their own right. Now, the the people who are going to make it in the gold rush are the people who came in 1848 and early 1849. That's almost across the board because they, they make their fortune in gold. And like most people who make a lot of money that way, they turn it around and they invest in land speculation. And they are still... Strangely or not, still some of the largest landowners in places like El Dorado County. There are families that go back to the 1840s. That's true in Napa also. So we are not far from that. Uh, some of those, those original land holdings are definitely still there. So they're the people who really make it in the gold rush. But the people who make it behind them are the women that start these independent businesses. They kind of put it on an ultimate timeline before I open this up to questions. Is you got to remember, as we evolve forward and create whatever narrative we've created in the 20th and 21st century with regards to all this, you got to remember, the first state to allow women the right to vote was Wyoming, followed very quickly by Colorado in the 18, both in 1890 and 1891, if I remember right. California waits till 1911. It still beats the the 1920s, but they still wait till 1911. So it's interesting to see how that evolves. But you see women's influence on the West and it does create a space for them. And realistically, that's traced to a heritage that comes from California. But ultimately, 
that comes out of New England and the put out system. Women are not the backwater that we like to portray them as. Uh, this, it, it forget the, the videos of the 1960s and 70s, forget the romanticized versions of the 1950s of the West. This is the real West. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, you can ask me about women. You can ask me about the museum. I am game. I'm hoping I'm on a decent timeline for you. Let's see what we've got. So that was just amazing. I learned so much. So thank you. Yeah, God, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yes, I want to hear you tell more and more and more. Do you do story hour at the museum? I, I don't, but I suppose we could. <laughs> and I have a question about, about the Saturday event. Is yeah. it in person or is yeah. it available on Zoom? Oh, yeah. I'm not afraid of people. Everything we do is in person. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It's just been wonderful. I just, um, I did a little research for a presentation for the city council for uh, Women's Month and found just a little bit. And so you just, I made me more, much more curious. So Good. You know, it, it's interesting. I mean, it, it's interesting that you get to, you know, as you're talking about kind of the evolution of women, and I don't know how far you're going with, with city council or, or not, but you know, by the time you get to the 1860s and late 1850s and you see women that are actually graduating from medical school and we look at it today and more women graduate than men from medical school right i mean it, it is an incredible experience I mean, there's three i think it's roughly 370 some odd women that have actual medical degrees in the mid-19th century All right we never hear about them we don't hear about that. We maybe we hear about Dr. Mary Walker, who got a Congressional Medal of Honor. That's probably a really questionable Congressional Medal of Honor in the 19th century, but that was revoked anyway. So she was sort of an odd duck. But you, you look at that, but you don't hear about people like I don't know Oriana Russell Moon. You don't hear about you know maybe Elizabeth Blackwell. She's sort of one of the first women to have a real medical degree. Right, because there's homeopathic, allopathic, and one I'm not going to remember, hydropathic. Um, so, you know, you forget about them, right? You forget about a lot of those people that are out there. Even, even Sarah Josepha Hale, who really is the mother of the cult of domesticity, and we kind of tend to throw sort of a negative light on, right, because she's promoting things like cleanliness is next to godliness and basically creating a home. She has four tenets to the cult of domesticity that really have to do with purity and kind of putting women on a pedestal. It's how we would look at it today. But is that truly the way it was in the 19th century? These are sort of giving guiding principles to how we function at home. Remember, women's sphere in the 19th century was considered the domestic sphere, which is ultimately the baseline for the anti-suffragist movement in the 20s. We don't, we, we give that up when we accept the right to vote, right? We all think that the right to vote is this great, brilliant thing that makes us citizens, but we're already citizens, right? It's, it's just a slightly different understanding. I mean, men go through varying degrees of citizenship with land ownership and, and rights to vote also, let's not forget that. But we get to this point where, We've given that up, right? With as as women being the head of our households, as far as that domestic sphere goes, as the people who hold the financial connectivity to the house, right? Yes, the the, the guys go off and, and make a living, but at the end of the day, the money goes to the domestic account in the 19th century, and the domestic account is run by the woman of the house. That's true whether we're talking about a tenement in New York or a plantation in Georgia. They do that work. Right, so they are considered also the moral centers of their households. And as such, you're, the goal is to raise good Republican sons and daughters, right? Because I, I'm not using it as a party, I'm using it as the fact that we live in a republic, our government is a republic, despite what we like to call it a democracy today, it, it's the republic. And we live in this republic and we're supposed to be active, men or women, we're supposed to be active in our sphere in our republic. And we forget that, I think. And we get up to the, the, 
the suffragist movement and women are clattering for, well, we want the right to vote because what can we do, right? We can now exert our influence through the vote. But the anti-suffragist movement would sit there and say, well, no, but you can't. You have more control over the societal construct at home. And if you really kind of look at it, you do. Because at home, you can impart everything from Republican motherhood, the cult of domesticity, to financial well-being, to crafting a society through the development of your children. So it's a different ideology. But I think we get lost in that, right? We so glorify the suffrage movement without actually looking and saying, okay, but where did it really take us? Do we have more influence as, as women right now? Because we can vote? I mean, I guess we do in the political sphere, we do in the social sphere, maybe, as far as that goes. But do we still retain that? You know, there, there is something to be said for putting someone on a pillar, justifiably or not. Do we still retain that that aura? I, I don't think we do, personally. I mean, that's, that, that is a true personal opinion, but I don't think we do. So don't forget those gals. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, I'm wondering, since you came here during the time when the schools are just going back to in-person learning and yeah. under a lot of stress, I wonder if school groups have started coming yet or if you are geared up for uh, leading school groups, you know, elementary level, middle school, high school level, and what kinds of things you are, are, are now or will emphasize that you have to show for the school kids. Okay, let me actually pull out a paper if I can. If it's right here, and I'm hoping it is, but it's probably not. Okay, so yes, we are 100% geared up for education programs. Uh, we've only seen one school, and so far it was actually a homeschool group that's come out. Uh, I think that's uh, kind of a failure on our own end. We've been heavily focused on marketing our education programs to our public schools. We've sort of ignored the private schools and the homeschool groups kind of historically as I, as I look at the changes that I want to move forward with with the institution. So I think that's been a slight misstep on our end. We need to remember that there are multiple facets to education and where we need to reach those audiences. I will say this, looking at the historic data from who attends our field trips, a good 80% of them are not from here. They are from the other side of the bridge. They are from all the way as far as Sacramento, but our own schools here in Benicia don't come. So mm -hmm. I find that very interesting. Uh, we don't see near the volume I think we should of our local schools. But yes, we are, um, to give you a kind of an idea, every kid who comes in our museum can get an activity book for free. So that actually has, if you're familiar with sort of the Junior Ranger program at Parks, it's kind of modeled off that. So there's something that they can do that takes them through the gallery as well. So everybody gets one if they want one. And it's Callie, who is our, our logo. She's our mascot. Uh, she sort of tells the story through the gallery for them. So kind of in her own words. So it, it's a one way to reach out to them. Uh, we also do have our field trip forms and field trip information. Stay tuned to our website. We're gonna crash it probably in the next three weeks or so and we'll get an entirely new one. Uh, the web developer is working on it now. But to give you an idea, we, the way we work with our education program, it's completely customizable. So we offer core programs on early California, California in the gold rush, and California in the Civil War. Each one of those programs has an option for the teacher to choose a specific hands-on program that's tailored to their student body or their student needs. So early California has uh, petroglyphs to brands and the architecture of early California as the hands-on options. Gold Rush has writing history and reading the river, which are two for the teacher to choose from. And the Civil War in California has the Civil War because that's the earliest branch of the army. In the so that's a fun thing to bring into this. 
Can I make a request that we all mute if you're not speaking? So I'm hearing somebody's cell phone ring. Thank you. So we also have non-traditional programs. My museum is aimed for a, a mixed grade audience. Uh, we have a be a curator program where you can actually create your own exhibit and learn how to do it. And we have an archaeology field school out here. So if you're interested in digging in the dirt and finding something cool, we may be the place for you. I want to I want to say how fascinated I was with your storytelling. I'm not somebody who's automatically drawn to history, but I think in retrospect, it's often because history has been told primarily by men and men focus on issues which are not interesting to me, you know, the wars and, and the politicians. And, but a woman telling history tends to include the, the domestic, the personal, the, the, which draws me in. So I was really shocked when you stopped telling because I was totally engrossed. Well, so, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I am going to take a wild guess, though, that it's not actually men that tell those stories, but it's academics who tell those stories. I come from ultimately a public history background where I'm used to dealing with, albeit I left the education field in museums almost 15 years ago at this point, but I still volunteer with California State Parks. I still go out and teach kids how to gold pan. I think the reality is the public history end of my profession, right? That deals with public education, which are willing learners, right? They're not classroom. Museum education is supposed to be willing learners. So if you come voluntarily to us and our, our gallery presents a program, our interpreters present a program, because I come from a world where we play in first person, we do costumed interpretation, material culture is our God basically, right? In that facet, I'll tell you about war, I can do that. I can tell you about politicians, but at the end of the day, that cultural construct has to come from, dare I say the not, what, what in our world is non-academic. I got it. I, I see you. Something that comes to my mind is you offering storytelling at the museum to your school, to your school visit groups. I'm sure that you're capable of, of gauging your stories to kindergartners all the way up through high school kids, because I just think you have that skill. And if the school started to see you doing little historical sketches in their setting, it might urge others to come out and visit the museum to to see that it could be a really fun excursion for the kids. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate your, your confidence in that. As I said, I haven't really, other than teaching gold panning, which is just sort of messing around in the water at this point, I, I haven't taught like that in a very, very long time. Most of what I do has historically at this point been back in the house working in, working under the curatorial field, right? So as I say, artifacts don't talk back to me. I can't really talk to them either. I, I have given my life to inanimate objects, but I look at it and if it's me personally, someone asked me what my favorite part of the day is in, in working in museums. And I, I you know, kind of took me by surprise. I said, you know, I don't think I have a favorite part of the day. I think I have two favorite parts of the day. And I think it still holds true. Now I'm just looking at my gallery in an entirely different perspective, right? But it's standing alone in an empty gallery. There's something, I don't know, almost like church to it, right? It's this, it, this empty gallery that is an homage to intellectualism, that is an homage to our wanting knowledge as human beings, our craving that sort of stimulation, our desire to be connected to our past that we don't often articulate perfectly on. And I just fall in love with it. I fall in love with it every time I'm alone in the gallery here. But then the second favorite part of my day is standing in a gallery that has a million people running around, right? And I don't see a million people here. I come from a place where I saw a couple of hundred people even just going out to do stuff in the gallery every time I walked out my door. But seeing that busy gallery where everybody else gets to enjoy what I get to enjoy alone in the morning. 
And, and again, as, as the person I am, and I think that there's more of me, for me, the artifacts are sort of boring, but hearing you talk, hearing you tell the story, I can see, I feel now I want to visit the museum again and put the artifacts together with what I heard you say. Right. And I think there are other, I think there are other people like me. Then I challenge you to find them and bring them here and we will do it. <laughs> Great. Tell me when you're coming. My tagline on everything I write is I'll see you at the museum. I'm a very hands-on director. So you want to bring a bunch of people out here? Bring a bunch of people out here. We'll figure it out. Okay, hey, great. I wanted to just say that um, when I was teaching school, which was I don't know, 15 years ago, um, the third grade classes were required to explore Benicia. Okay. And uh, that was left up to their parents to take them around and they had a checklist and they had to go to the state capitol and they had to find this, this thing and one of the, and that thing. And one of the places they were included, they included was the camel barn. Okay. At that time, the museum was not at the level, the quality level it is now. It was just kind of a repository of, of, of artifacts. That just kind when of, were you last here? Hmm? When were you last here? When was I last there? Uh, we were there, I think we were here there last year. Okay. We came to see the, um, well, we were particularly interested in the Miwok exhibit. Oh, okay, with the Patwin? The Patwin, yeah. And okay. also the coins you had. Um, I got fascinated with the coin exhibit. Okay. That, was, that was really interesting to me. Uh, years ago, my mother, when Henry Wasserman was running the museum, um, my, we took my parents out there to see it and she came across the grand piano and she could play pretty well. So she sat down and played some songs from the 1920s for a while. Okay. <laughs> Henry asked her to come back every week and she said, no, no, I'm not gonna do that. So, so we've seen it, we've seen it uh, go through uh, a lot of um, transitions and it's getting better and better and better. I think you'll like what's coming. Thank you. Anyone else? So Goon, you, you frequent the historical mu museum? He's on our mailing list as a, I, I believe he has a membership, but I know, I know you also donated to us and I thank you very much for that. Yeah, <clears throat> yes, no, I mean, uh, raised in Europe, museums is a natural thing. Um, I mean, I was shocked when I <clears throat> went into an antique store here in town and they explained to me that if anything was older than 50 years of age, it was an antique. And in Europe, it's barely broken into. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge difference. Um, but to me, no, I mean, culture, history, this town, I, I heard on TV one time that Benicia has more houses from the, from the 1800s than any other place in California. I, mean, so, I don't know, but- I, um, I don't know, that could very well be. Yeah, and, uh, and like I said, was it 1911 and women got the vote? My sister lived in, Al in Albuquerque, New Mexico for a while. And I realized that New Mexico became a state in 1911. Yeah. So we have a little advantage age-wise compared to New Mexico. Yeah. And, and this that, you know, California was an island. People think it's literally that we really were surrounded by water, but <laughs> it was a different <laughs> island because the United States was way over by the Mississippi River. And we were out here. So, but what I liked was, yes, your enthusiasm, but also the fact that I had never considered this, that we have had Mexican and Spanish yeah. laws yeah. much more. Of course, it makes sense, but I just never even yeah. thought of it. It's a huge difference between yes. New England. Yes. Yeah. 
no. So, uh, no, I mean, I love living in the little town of Venetia that is for California standards, not European <laughs> standards, but California standards <laughs> has a lot of history. Yes. Okay, we have two museums and the state capitol. But like you're right, we don't make a lot of noise about any of it really. People now come to town for the restaurants, maybe yeah. some of the arts. Well, but... since, since you brought up the fact that we have two museums, I will let you in on my surprise for next week. We are taking the, muse, the fire museum collection. That is our big news. You are taking over the fire museum? We are taking their collection. Okay. That will find a new home with us. Excellent. That, that is that is our big news. So there you go. There's your first video official announcement. You got to hear something nobody else has yet, but it is going to print next week. So I okay. think it'll be fine. Wow. That, yes. that will all be finding a new home with us. Okay. So the next move would be like the historical society. <laughs> it should be merging and have one. You got to understand, museums very rarely take each other over. Um, in fact, when I call oh, my I colleague- think, uh, not, I the, to, not an acquisition, a merger. It, it, well, no, it's, it is an acquisition. It, it is truly an acquisition at this point. Okay. Um, but no, it happens very, very rarely. And when I called my colleagues and said, hey, oh my God, what do I do? <laughs> uh, this is nothing I've ever touched. Everybody kind of looked and shrugged and I talked to people in person. I called them on the phone. I said, whoa, you know, and they go, well, I don't know, the Autry did it about 20 years ago. Yep. And I'm going, okay, well, we're not the Autry. So, you know, I, I need a little help here. And they go, well, gee, everybody kind of threw their hands up on me. Uh, so this is going to be a very slow and methodical process. I can't destroy my own career. So I, it's going to take time, yep. but it will be in our custody. Uh, by the end of April, so it is. It is going to be here, and we will figure out how we do the interpretation and how we work with that. So that stay tuned for on how that's going to work. We're still working out all the final details on that, and probably won't have an answer for several months. But it will reside here, and we'll start the inventory process probably at the beginning of May. That we'll start bringing those items home. Uh, the, the Phoenix, the 1822 pumper that's there does belong to the De Young. I'm working with them right now to see what will happen. If it all has to come back here, then that will have to go back to the De Young because we don't have a facility to take care of it. But everything else that is quote owned by that museum at the moment by Venetia Volunteer Fireman Inc. will come reside here. Okay. Good. It will be in good hands and we'll get that stuff back on display for everybody to come out and see it. Yeah. No, but I'm also disappointed to hear that the Venetia schools are, are not. I think that too, and I'm trying to figure out how we work with that. I, just solely numbers wise, yeah. it's about 80% from out of the area. So, I'm, I mean, that, that's great that we have oh, yes. that kind yeah, of. Yeah. But the Benicia uh, kids are our own kids. Yes. Yeah. Story, story, your story times in the schools. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah. yeah. I, I think my, my docent core at this point is a little freaked out by some of the changes we made to the education program because it is a considerably more academic program than we've been offering. Um, so I don't know. I have a feeling I may end up teaching a handful of these until I can. Is there anything, this is going to sound strange, huh. is there anything um, that you need for your collection? My family's been in California since 1848. So and we are an actively. I have a lot of stuff. <laughs> we are an actively collecting institution. So there are things that we are kind of. We don't have an acquisitions budget, so it would have to be a donation at this point. Yeah, yeah. I'm cleaning house, so. <laughs> yes. Uh, 
Specifically, well, as we rebuild Gold Rush, we are looking for Gold Rush related artifacts. Okay. Uh, preferably not ones that go beyond 1860, however. Okay. But yeah, I mean, I, we strangely, we have very few um, original like daguerreotypes or ambrotypes or ferrotypes in the collection. We have a lot of, you know, albumin photos, but we really don't have any of the early American photos like that, uh, which would be something that, that I think would augment our collection very nicely. Right now, I, if you are going to go down that road, the way the process would be to, to come in, either meet with our curatorial or myself, and we kind of go through it. There is a process, and I'm not putting, I'm not putting the kibosh on donations right now, but we are going to be hit with a roughly 2,500 piece collection within the next- That's month. what I was asking for you going to have it. <laughs> with the fire museum. And in order to run an institution that adheres to as close to we can as professional standards through AAM, I do need to focus on dealing with one collection at a time in that respect, because this is a huge acquisition. Sure. And I, I will need to check with, my daughters, but particularly the one. Well, one of my daughters is, is a um, costume historian, but works for two different museums. As a one is, she's a senior ranger aide at William I. Adobe. Yeah. Okay. And she also uh, is putting up an exhibit on from 1920 for Turtle Bay Museum in Reading. Okay. So if I, you know, pictures of clothing <laughs> or, or, you know, don't give that away, Mom. You know? Right, right, right. So, yeah, in fact, I have a whole closet full of clothes that I want to give away that she says, no, no, she's she's curated them and they're hanging in my spare bedroom closet wrapped in tissue paper and hanging. And it's like, okay, come on. It's a three bedroom house. It's 1400 square feet. This is not, <laughs> not a museum. But thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And once I get done volunteering with everything else I volunteer with, I'll be out there to. Well, I like working with kids and I like telling stories that, too. That would be fantastic. We are really looking for volunteer help, especially people that are willing to help with our education programming. Yeah. I mean, but I'm, I'm going to come out regardless. <laughs> so if you do come out and give us a shout, I, I'm always here Tuesday through Friday. I work at 410. But I'm often here on the weekends, so just come out and look for me. And now we know what you look like. <laughs> <laughs> Not that exciting, I know, but you know, hey, I was a back of the house employee for a lot of years. <laughs> All right. So, what do you, what do you think, Cynthia? I think it sounds like there's no more questions. All right. Thank you so much. I found Thank that fascinating. Much. Thank you very much for having me. I either we hope we do it again sometime or you guys come out here. Yeah, we should uh, take a field trip to your place. You should. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. We'll get that on the on the books. Perfect. Definitely. I would love a, a village field trip out there. Yes. Yeah. Especially uh during May with that exhibit you told us about. Come at the first part of May. It's going to close toward the end of May. So okay. I, I would suggest the first part of May. Okay, good deal. All right. Thank you much, guys.